first I'll say thank you all for coming. It's very exciting. And if you, when you look at these, I do want you to touch them. Unlike painting or uh, whatever, fine art, you know, these, these want to be touched, which you can probably tell when you walk by them. And, and some of these uh, fibers come from people who, like Megan Campbell, gave me a bunch of fibers, you know Megan, yeah. and she knits and so on. And so some of this is her repurpose. There's, so she's a knitter, and it was stuff she couldn't use. And so then it's like, my God. This has a little patchwork. I actually really like sewing on, um, doing a little patchwork on top. This is sewn on. And um, so anyway, they want to be touched. Certain things you wouldn't touch as much. This piece of some dried flowers, you shouldn't go and touch the dried flowers. <laughs> They can fall out. Um, but yeah, there was another one there. This piece has gone the distance. It's gone to a lot of places. So, so I think I'll start um, my talk by talking about shame because uh, I just want to tell you a Brene Brown story. And you can tell me how shame connects with weaving. So while well, Annie demonstrates, the first time I went to a Sawari weaving class, which is the kind of weaving. Uh, that she's doing. This is a saori loom. This loom was made in Japan, and um, it's the, the saori is a brand, so it's very many brand. So you, it's very hard to find a loom that looks exactly like this one. I did find one in New Zealand, um, but this is a very specific model that saori designed um, to make weaving very easy, so that anybody could sit down like this. A group of people do it. So when I went to my first saori weaving class, I was sitting across from a woman. And um, they don't give you a lot of instruction, because that's the whole point of salary. They just do what I did for the gen. Like, here's what you do, pass the shuttle, and have a good time. And then, you're, and then the teacher, Mihoko, who's um, opened the first salary studio in the US 20 years ago, so she walks away. And I'm sitting across from this woman, and I was so excited, because I was like, it, it was like, a lot had brought me to that moment to be sitting there reading. So I was kind of like, Annie, I was like this, I was pregnant, I was sweating, it was like really, a really amazing moment for me. And the woman I was sitting across, I think her name was Oprah, which, she had some kind of fantastic name like that. We started talking, and she was like, oh, this is horrible. I said, what? She's like, this is, this is really, I can't, why my edges aren't straight? I don't know if you can see. Well, this lady here, right, this one's got a little bit of a bottom. Um, some of them, you could, they kind of have straight edges. But when you're weaving in, in Saori, you're not supposed to focus at all on your edges. This is awful. And, well, you know, why can't I get a little more instruction? You know, this is really actually very hard to do. And we started talking about being perfectionists. And then once we started talking about being perfectionists, we started talking about shape. And so then we started talking about Brené Brown. Now you know you have to advance your work because you're almost to the end of it there. So when you look at these, I hope that you look at them and you think, well, these don't look like the things I've seen <laughs> that have been handwoven, right? Hopefully, they don't look like, well, I don't know, Clark's shirt is handwoven, and that scarf's probably woven, and Christina's scarf is woven. And, uh, that's probably a woven piece right there, machine woven. So anything that's machine woven will have straight selvages. It will have straight edges. It will have very little texture, right? So hopefully you look at these and you go, these are kind of weird. Uh, or funky, or textural, or different. And if that's how you feel about them, then I have, that I have succeeded. <laughs> so I want to tell you how shame connects to uh, the story of Misao Joe. So Saori weaving was founded by a woman named Misao Joe, who was a Japanese woman. And she started weaving when she was 57 years old, which is great. She lived to be 102. So, um, she was very inspiring, and she started to weave in Japan, and she was weaving to make like kimonos, like very beautiful, delicate, and she made a mistake, and she thought it was interesting, but she tried to sell it, and the person in the store was like, you can't sell that because it's not perfect. And she thought it was beautiful. And so she started to really think about the difference between a human being and a machine. And 
If that's not relevant, I mean, that's like a long time ago, but if that's not a relevant conversation to what's happening now with AI, AI in art, and AI in writing, right, books, like if that's not relevant, it's so potent. So she really started to think, what's the difference between a human being and a machine? I don't want to weave like a machine, so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to make mistakes on purpose, and if there are mistakes, I'm going to let them be. Traditional weaving is a OCD perfectionist orgy. Like it is for people who really are exact, mathematical, and they, I'm not saying there's a hierarchy, it's really a beautiful way. Um, but anything like this, I would fail. Like if I'm stuck doing Swedish weaving, I would, I would completely fail, they kick me out. My salvages <laughs> aren't straight, you know, things are sticking out. I'm trying to find something that was a real um, mistake. There was a mistake, like a warp, oh here, a warp thread. So uh, there's a warp thread that came out. So that would be considered a mistake that you'd want to repair. Um, but I didn't repair it because I'm weaving salary. So that, you know, you can see how that connects to this this concept of shame, because what happens to us is that we want to be perfect, we want to have straight edges, we want to be smooth, we want, you know, smooth, like Ted over there spelt, <laughs> Ted with the hat, the jacket. Um, we don't want to be bumpy, we don't have our mistakes on the outside, right? Nobody wants to go around. But if you think about it, until it really the industrial revolution until we found that machines could make all of our clothing everything you wore was handmade we have a question. yeah nothing is really perfect it's just a title that people put onto people oh you should make this night these and like how we put our standards to just the words when it came up with but it's nothing what was the word you said with an n nothing is really perfect we put our it's just, it is a term that we use. Yeah, yeah. but nothing's perfect. Like, hey, like when you're painting, oh, you mess up there, it's not perfect. Right. Like, ooh, like nothing's really perfect. People can change things up. Yeah. People can make, make mistakes, but it's still perfect. And, the, and it is perfect, which is exactly what Misa Jo, well, that was her whole thing. She said, I don't believe, I, I'm going with my kimonos with their mistake. I don't believe there's a mistake in my fabric. I believe it's perfect. Here's another example. This has a double. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but there's a double warp line. So it makes a slight variation in the fabric, which I think is really beautiful and interesting. So that's exactly what Misao Zhou did. She started making mistakes on purpose. She decided that it was beautiful. And then she started to have experiences where she'd, be, you, she'd weave something, like one of these things here, and then she'd be over working on a, 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 another project, and then she'd feel like it was talking to her. It's alive. And what she felt was that everything had its own kin say, everything had its own sensibility, its own aliveness. The fabric that she was weaving, which is very different than fabric that's machine woven, right? Most of our clothing comes from machine weaving in countries not our own, done by people who are in probably pretty dire situations, being paid for salary. And um, if you think about the food we do, right? Like, so I want to eat my cow who had a nice life and died a good death. And they say that kind of meat, I'm a vegetarian, so I can use this example, that kind of meat is like really better for you. Well, same thing with your clothes. In a way, this kind of clothing is like a lie. It's like, this is like a cow that had a good life. And now it's going to be the fabric that's on your body. And it's very different than the life that the machine woven clothing goes through. So anyhow, Nisa Joe, uh, starts to do this and then she begins to work with people who have intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, and so forth. And she works with a group of women with intellectual disabilities and she feels like the weaving is from God. She's never seen, she's not actually a religious person, but she feels like she's never seen anything so beautiful. So then she really starts um, just teaching it. She stops just making, she starts teaching weaving and they design these looms so that anybody can use them. They can go up, they can go down, they have ways to use these if you don't have feet, if you don't have hands. Um, there are all kinds of adjustments you can get for them. There are metal ones, they can travel. 
And she's teaching weaving in like groups and communities. So people are, you could actually take off. Most looms don't have this. You could take all of this off and uh, put it away. Let's say Pat was doing one weaving in, in a class and then you put it away and you take another one and you put it up. Um, so I think it's pretty powerful to just contemplate that concept that we are really different than machines. <coughs> Bless you. And I feel like, for me, because you all know me as a yoga teacher and a minister for 20 years, uh, it doesn't feel any different to me, the work, this work, than anything else. It feels to me like a ministry of cloth. And it's good. What me, Sajo, wanted people to do is to weave themselves. So the word salary is a combination of her name and the word weaving. But it also means weave thyself. So the idea is you would sit down and you would learn something about yourself while you were, while you were weaving, um, which is certainly an experience for me. But it also has been interesting for me to weave for other people and have people have the experience of putting on a cloth. Um, Rachel's piece was made from her hoppa that she was married under, but that hoppa was part of her grandmother's wedding dress and her mother's skirt. And so that was woven with some yarn and the pieces of the beautiful satin and then trimmed with the satin from her grandmother's wedding dress. So to sit down and weave with people's clothing, and uh, I did this with Christina's mother's clothing, is, is very, very moving. But it's also equally moving, and those are like really moving examples, but Jen, as an example, gave me some dishcloths that were dirty and, uh, you know, this is a great example of something that the Salvation Army doesn't want. And so what are you going to do with it? Uh, we give clothes to the Salvation Army or to Goodwill. The numbers vary a lot, so I'll tell you some numbers, but they're all, there's some range. Maybe 18% of what we donate uh, gets reused or sold. The majority of it goes actually to the landfill. And the stuff that seems like it could still be valuable gets sent to Africa and uh, a lot in Ghana. Can I show you a picture of what happens to most of it there? Because we have six, enough clothing for six generations without making another piece of clothing. So we could clothe everyone on the planet for six generations. Uh, textiles are, we're in such a sort of textile luxury. Um, so here's a picture of a mountain of clothing. So what we send, right, and what they can't use. So that's just one oh picture. Gosh. Right? That's amazing. That's amazing. So that rag is a really good example of like, not even in your wildest dreams is anyone at the Goodwill going to be like, I want that pretty purple <laughs> rag. So Jen gave me some of those and a couple of things. And this piece is woven on a recycled cotton warp. Those are the vertical threads. And the horizontal threads are a rag, a scarf, a foil gold balloon, some um, artificial flowers and some ribbon that the artificial flowers are on. And that's it. That's what that piece was woven from. And what's interesting to me is that when Jen brought me those things, this scarf, which is this piece, she's like, I just love this piece of fabric. But I don't use it, don't know what to do with it, but I really love it. You probably all have something in your life that's like that, like you actually love, like I have a lot of clothes, I'm like, I really love it, but when I, it doesn't look right on me, I don't look good in it, it's, you know, I love Tommy, like he's not here, bless his heart, I have to bleep this out, but he buys me a lot of clothes, but they don't always look good on me, because I don't try them on, but I love them, and I'm going to wear them because I love him, but actually I'm going to weave with them. <laughs> I'm going to cut them up, because I love the fabric, or the feeling of them, right? So that's, it, Adeline, who's not here, because she's 16 and she left, um, said, Mom, what, you know, what difference does any of this make? 
Now I've put a little bit of information on each of these about what's happening. So right now we have six generations worth of clothing on the planet. You go buy something from Target or what's it called, Old Navy. On average, those pieces are in the landfill within how long a time do you think? Two years. It would be a season. Six months. A year. Six months. Six yeah. months. Six months. I only know that from the way my kids have worn them. <laughs> Six, I'm like, didn't I just buy this? So. Well, kids, you know, kids are growing, so at least there's like some making sense about that. But for adults, and we love to buy clothes, right? It's wonderful to buy new things and put things on. Um, which is why it's fun to make these under clothing, but within six months. So what has happened is that we have such a textile surplus, and that goes not just with uh, clothing, but actually you go to uh, webs and you buy for your weaving, that we could, um, yeah, it's the textile surplus that makes it possible for us to have everything that we want, and yet with the textile, see how that fun that is with that little bit? What it means is we actually buy, I might get the numbers wrong, but again, every time, if you look at different sources, they vary a little. We buy something like three times as much clothing, and we wear it 50% as often. Anyway, this is made from a Salvation Army dress, which I thought was deeply ugly. <laughs> the dress was so ugly. <laughs> And that's how I was inspired. I was like, I would never wear that ugly polyester dress. Right? Of course, a lot of our clothing is made from polyester, which never, never, never decays, never composts. So you can see some of that dress there, right? That's, the, that's part of it. That was the dress. Holy synthetic. So that's woven with a reclaimed black yarn and on 100% cotton board with one of Jen's flowers, put inside it. So uh, my real hope, you know, when I wrote to Sue and I was like, I'd love to do something for Earth Day, is uh, my own dying consciousness, I've been giving lots of things to Salvation Army, lots of things to, good, to Goodwill, to really think about, um, not like a poverty mentality, not like Rondo White clothes, like just live with what you have, but some kind of consciousness about fabric as, uh, the closest thing to our skin. So you, you may not think your clothing is important, but if you have children or uh, relatives that you go on to your next adventure in life and you're not on the material plane anymore and you leave all those people with your closet full of clothing, it is so potent, right? You think, oh my gosh, you know, that shirt was worn. It was that person's favorite shirt. But then you also have the project, but what am I going to do with all of this clothing? I knew a woman who was a quilter, and what she did is she took some guy who liked Hawaiian shirts, and he had like 300 Hawaiian shirts. She made a quilt entirely out of Hawaiian shirts. So our, our fabric is it's what's on us. It carries our energy. It expresses us. And if I go back for a minute just to that concept of the not being machine made. When I started weaving these pieces, I thought, well, they're just a little weird. Uh, you know, that's okay on your wall. That's a little weird to wear them. You know, because they're just a little not like what you'd normally be wearing because they're not machine made. So they have, you know, all of the texture, the sensation. Weaving with fabric creates a very different, if you feel any of these, this is from quilting scraps. Um, it creates a more dense, even if you cut them like very, very tiny, you know, you can get that, but there's a density inside of that. And it makes me think, and this is probably the last thing I'll say, is just that that experience for me, you know, loving to weave, loving the colors, so on, and then going, well, it's still a little, you know, will I wear this out? It's a little different. You know, where will I go in this? How has my concept of beauty been shaped? Our concept of beauty has actually been shaped, like what's beautiful on our body has been shaped by capitalism <laughs> and machines. And then we go, well, wait a second. 
even to the point where what would I think was beautiful to put on my body, I may not even know because I've actually been so, right? That's really fascinating to think. And when I was sitting one, uh, making uh, the weaving seminar this summer, and making a piece into the jumper, some of you have seen me wear in my videos, whatever, uh, my teacher Mihoko came over, and we were sewing and doing it, and I was like, oh, Mihoko, I just, you know, my, it was like this, the selvage, so the edge was like this. And she, this woman, would not give a talk like this. It's, she has few words, and they're very powerful. And she said, but Sam, they're your selvages. And that's all she said. I don't even think she put emphasis. She's like, they're your selvages. They're your edges. So to go back full circle, I'm sitting across from Opal, my friend, talking about Brene Brown. And we go, well, immediately she'll tell us how to get these edges straight. So we said, Mihoko, like we're having fun, but we want this to look like normal. <laughs> right? That's, we want this to look like what it's how can we get the edge straight? And she said, we don't do that here. <laughs> That's what she said. We don't, we don't do that here. And that was really uh, the mission of Misa Joba. She didn't do what I'm talking about with fast fashion, reusing them. So different, um, actually, there was a Japanese tradition of sakiori weaving, which is rag weaving. And that was because there weren't enough textiles. It, wasn't, it was really because they couldn't get their hands on what they needed to weave with. So they just rip or tear the clothing and weave it back in to make clothing. It was actually an exercise of necessity. Even sakiori weaving stopped in about the 1940s in Japan because of the textile surplus that we have. So anyway, Nisajo wasn't about this particular thing that I'm doing here, but I think they blend beautifully, particularly as we think about I am not a machine. and How is that forming my consciousness of what's beautiful? And so then I'll just finish with uh, the plastic bag weaving over there, which to me is just, it's just prime example. I collected plastic bags over about two weeks in the house. You wouldn't believe how many things are in plastic bags. My bread, my cookies, and everything else. <laughs> I can't think of anything else I eat. Basically everything is in a plastic bag, unless it's in a cardboard box. And that's what came. And it's really lovely. The light isn't exactly hitting it, but it's really lovely. Um, when the light comes through with all the different colors. There is some metal balloon inside there. So anyway, thanks for listening. And um, I really just try to make up a question if you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> for the media, make it, make it look lively. Well, I, I have a question. Um, do, have you made any, I mean, because as far as these are wonderful, but for the practicality of, say, like rugs and things like that. Yeah. Have you be, Have you tried weaving any? And and if you have, have they been durable? What yeah. kinds of materials have you used for rugs? Yeah, I haven't woven any rugs yet. Yeah, because that's right now. I'm looking. That's your kind of rug. Oh. Rugs are wonderful with fabric. Right. I actually, have one that was hand woven in India. And you can see the beautiful fabric. I haven't felt. A drawing to a rug, yeah. You'll come help me. Yeah, I'll come help you. I have not, my soul has not spoken rug. Um, many other things, but not rug. So, anybody else? Emma. Are they comfortable? Yeah, you should try it on. This one, the black, um, the black is a little bit uh, itchy, I think. Um, might have some wool. It really depends on what's what's actually in it. But, um, I think that's a little itchy. This has only a little bit, so this is rayon chenille, mostly new material, except for the purple. This is very soft. Yeah. Are those comfortable? Not too warm. Only this one is too warm. This has a Salvation Army dress in it. Um, that's the purple cotton there. That's. I think this is pretty comfortable, but it's also quite heavy. So it's really like wear it on a whole day. You wove that? You made that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I love this. This, I, when I was pregnant, this is made from 19 feet of fabric. Oh, and I forgot to say, when you're weaving salary, you make it into clothing, it's no waste. So if you weave 19 feet, you use every single part of it. You know, there's no little, because when you normally sew, you cut this out, you cut that out, none of that. 
you know, this is, this is the whole thing. And you figure out how to use all of it. Like you say, if you even had a little piece, you might make a pocket. Yeah. But you had to do some sewing too, obviously. Yeah, this was sewing, yeah. So you do straight pieces and then you, you cut, you design <laughs> them. Oh, cool. You made that right? I did. It's nice. So on the other Yeah, I accept the compliment that I was a costume designer, or also a very famous sewist. Um, <laughs> but not true at all. <laughs> not true at all. If they was so worried that you could look at the book, uh, they give patterns that are very simple. So you saw Joe wanted people to make their own clothing. Um, she thought that that was very important. And she tells you a little bit, but the, the, the patterns and descriptions are like this. And that's it. So you wouldn't use an actual pattern that you cut out like you do when you make clothing. And it's very basic. That's why things are like, this is a little boxy. Right? If I, was, if I wanted to show up my waist, this wouldn't be the right thing. <laughs> I would call it drapey. <laughs> drapey. It's drapey. It's drapey. for your body. Yeah. So no, I mean, I did sew when I was a girl. And I always felt I sewed very, very poorly. And I always wished I could make my own clothing, but I felt I was bad at it. Um, which is why I love the sorry is like, but you can make clothing. Because you can change your idea about what, what it's supposed to look like. So did you just go to one workshop and then that was it? You were home at the machine and you started doing it? Or did, how, how did that work? Did you have to take multiple classes? I took multiple classes. I also weave on a rigid heddle, which is about a 48 inch uh, tall loom that I didn't bring because it's too uh, hard to bring. So the, a lot of that rigid heddle weaving is self-taught. Like I had a weird situation, which is like it all just came to me in a dream. And then I just did it. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that kind of a thing, other than you all know me and I'm weird. <laughs> so. Um, do you ever do like small table weave uh, looms? Oh yeah, little table, table loom. loom. Yeah. I have a, I don't have a piece here that I did it, but I have a little lap loom. That's so basic, it's over, under, over, under, over, under. Okay. Yeah, and for that one, if anyone's seen the one, I, the nature weaving I did, um, I used that. So it doesn't have a bead, it doesn't have a bead, it doesn't have treadles, it doesn't even have a rigid heddle. You have a, your, uh, your reed lifts the half of the threads up and puts them down. So yes, I have just a very basic one. Um, anything else? Yeah. This isn't a question, but I just love the color combination. Like in that and yeah. that one, and it's just gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Do you want to feel that? Yeah, you can pass it and feel. It's pretty wonderful to uh, play with the colors. So I'll tell you, um, you put on a warp, you pick the color. So this is the warp, the vertical thread. Uh, for a woman in uh, Florida, my wonderful friend Janet Connor wanted me to weave her an altar cloth. So she gave me the dimensions. And she wanted it to be the, the fire goddess. So this is her fire goddess altar cloth. She is, she wouldn't call herself a teacher, she calls herself a director in the theater of the miraculous <laughs> and a mystic witch and a prayer artist. And so I had woven her a prayer stole. So this was her prayer altar. So that's one thing woven on a certain set of vertical threads that are purple and orange. And I had more of that work. And I thought, well, that one's pretty bumpy. So I just wove well, one more simply. So that's the same warp. Same, similar color, right? And then, uh, I had a little bit of work left, and I decided I would have a little more fun. So th th this one is really alive. She's definitely alive. And this is woven from the same warp as those. The weft is different, and everything here in the weft is from my leftover bag. So if you look in here, um, of course, that's from Jen. This is from, oh, this is the same purple as in here. These are the warp threads from that project. So a lot of these are just maybe that much that wouldn't be used for anything else. And I sort of have a bag of them. And I wove them in, and I was weaving with um, Arwen when he was weaving with me. And we just started to sing. And we wove 
And we're like, here she comes, the fire goddess. <laughs> but that's just an example, like the very same warp, right? And how different it is, whatever you decide to put in, however alive you want to make it. And I like it that day. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody want anybody want to try the weaving? I want to try. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to um, there's not much room, so I'm just gonna advance it. You do me a favor and push your foot on this little wooden, push it upward. That's it. And then we're going to pull it in. Yeah, keep it up a little bit. That's it. OK, now put it down. All right, so that, that's how we advance the warp. And then tighten it up over here. And then shoot tight here. This is a little bit, uh, usually we have a much wider, but this was a project because it has this really funny purple stuff in it. I had no idea what that would do. So fun. So just put a foot down. What would you like to weave with? You can weave with the scraps, you can weave with the yarn. Some of the pieces are cut already. And while Rachel's weaving, if anybody else wants to say anything else, so you can say it. So put a foot down. Either one, yeah, it doesn't matter. And then put your fabric through. It really doesn't matter where you put the fabric. Oh, because it gets. Yeah, and then switch feet. So fabric in, switch, beat. That's it. And you keep that same foot down. So put your right foot back down. Fabric through. So you think fabric, yarn, switch. Switch, then beat. And that's the whole rhythm. So fabric. Yes, yeah, so keep that foot down. So fabric. where um, it's not straight across, but it's like some, and then like making designs that way, if you've any of them. Yeah, like which is like tapestry weaving. Right. Um, so if you look at that, is it a little bit, like if you look at the plastic one, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. you can see a little of that happening, right? So mm -hmm. there's this shape being made. Is that what you're talking about? It is, yeah. Yeah, you put a little bit on one side. So, so in traditional tapestry weaving, you would have a picture image behind, and you would then, you know, you, would, you know, you'd have a picture of a tree, and then it would show you exactly where, and you would go around just one place. Um, I don't know what else is really like that. <clears throat> yeah. So how do you? Um, Maybe a little bit this one. Yeah. How do you get those like landscape moments? Well, you have to have a picture behind it, or you have to do like what I, all everything I've done here is abstract. So in summer, you would never have a plan. You would never, in fact, this piece, I wrote at the same time on the same loom, the 48 inch loom, as this piece. So they're side by side. And that was, I was going to call it family blues, because this is the goat rope from my goats, from their hay. And I was going to use a lot of that, which is actually all, this is all plastic bag and goat rope. Which, and I love this one, that's, that's the wake of the fairy. But you don't think it's the wake of the fairy. You're sitting there, who knows what it is for you. So I thought, oh, well, I'll do that. And while I'm making this, which is supposed to be a sunrise, but somebody told me it looked like a plate of orange sushi, um, <laughs> or a basket of eggs, this one just decided, to just, it was just very clear that if I was doing the sun, I was going to do the moon. So that's what it became. Um, I couldn't weave soury if I had a plan or a design behind and it was doing a traditional tapestry weaving. Because you are supposed to be getting in touch with your intuitive sense of things. Which is a skill that we don't get tired. So when you if you wanted to like your last piece there, yeah. that's the Yes. Yeah, how would you do that? How would you do that? Well, you would go around, let's say you're here, you go a little bit through. Pull it up and then beat. 
switch feet in the zoo. That's it. And then let's keep going. Let's go back just through these. And the beat. And then let's keep going. That's okay if you have the bum. So let's say she does this for a while just through a few. And it makes a little hill. And then you keep going. And then maybe later on you decide, oh, I want to have some purple or some yarn on the other side. But you can't beat to that point. That's, that's where you'd use a comb. I just use these. They're actually tapestry combs, the combs that are very heavy. But you would go, keep going just on one side. Yeah. Well, how happens if you don't, like, push it back in your... Oh, well, then you have a very loose weave. No, but I, like, once or twice. If you only did it once or twice? Or if you didn't do it? you forget to do it. Oh, then the next time it would, you know, it might create a little space. Let's see. Um, there's space, and on this, in this one on purpose, if you come and see, there's a little hole in it, and there's a looser space. So that's where I didn't be. Is it crispy? Because it's plastic. <laughs> you wouldn't know unless you touched it. Oh, I should stop making that sound. <laughs> but this, this one is all cut. So that has a better sound. This one is all cleaning products. Anyway. We can talk about it all, all day, but I will just say one more thing now, because you brought up the intuition. I'll tell you a story that I was two, when I was at Yale Divinity School, I was tutoring a boy, and he was uh, just about to plunk out of school. He was uh, 13 years old, he was reading at a third grade level, and when I'd been at Smith, I was trained to be an English teacher. And I knew that if you missed the magic moment for reading, that you wouldn't be able to be a reader. His mother came crying, crying, please, do you think you can help? They're gonna. Uh, you know, kick him out. He's on. This is the ghetto in New, New Haven. There are other ghettos, so the kid is just really lost. I said, "Sure, I'll tutor him." Um, and then I thought, "Well, I'm not going to read anything that I learned. I'm not going to refresh from my classes on how to teach reading. I'm just going to believe that this kid can read." So I went and I tutored him for about one semester. And I, I go in there and I just was like, "This kid can read," and I'm just going to use my intuition. And listen, which is what you do when you're weaving, like what color's next, in order to be able to do it. And at the end of that semester, his mother came to me in the library, the New Haven Library, with a piece of paper. She, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. And she shows me his report card. And you know, remember, he'd been reading at a third grade level. This was an eighth grade kid. He had made a three grade improvement in his English, in his reading, not only that, in every single other subject. Three grade levels. We're talking about from January to May or June. Now, I'm not a genius. I'm not even a, um, a reading tutor. But that was the sense that I tapped into. And that's the same sense. That's the way I you know, give a sermon. With, I just open my mouth. Something will come up. Right? But that's the sense that Misa and Joe wanted people to develop. And that's where, you know, when we only do things, paint by numbers, weave in a traditional way, paint in a traditional way, we aren't using that skill. And that's the skill that she wanted people to sit down at the loom, and then you're going to make something, and it will look different, but it will be real, not machine made. So that, that kind of intuitive ability is. Anyway, Rachel's demonstrating it right now. It's so much fun. Isn't it fun? And you didn't even, all you needed me to tell you that, and then, love, and then she I go so, go gadget. I can so see how you just want to dive into this. Yeah. Because it's really fun. I actually took a weaving class when I was in college a long time ago. Probably different than this. Yeah, I mean, we, you're weaving on a loom. That's fun. Yeah. But it, yeah, it was only with yarn. But this is so fun, and someone should kick me off. <laughs> Does anybody else want to go? Or we like we like watching Rachel weave. Yeah. Can you explain like where you get the fabric that you're weaving into? This. Oh yeah. So the work. Let me take this off because I'm actually a little hot. 
you know, always hot, as my children know, but um, running hot. Yeah, so the warp, the vertical threads. You've got some things yeah. to track. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so those, uh, if you see the ones I have on there, I, I, I took, you're supposed to, there are a lot of rules in weaving. And the rules in weaving would have you take a, a really strong, stable yarn to make your work. And even though th this part is very easy, warping is very time consuming and it takes a certain level of skill and a lot of equipment. This is why nobody weaves, this is why everyone knits. Because you can go buy two knitting needles. Warping, you know, to getting this was a lot and then you have to get the warping board. So you take a bunch of threads and you put them around on a warping board and you count them 10, 20, 40. 80, and you push them back, and they have to be a certain tautness, and then you tie them up here, and tie them up there, and tie them up here, and tie them up there. That's it. Should we make more room? Okay, so put your foot on that break, and I'm going to take this break off, and then you're going to turn this. That's it. Good. And then stop. Put your break back on. I'll put mine on. I'm going to tighten it up here, and then you tighten it up here. Perfect. And then you can keep going. So, um, and then you flip this puppy over on this loom. I flip over the beater, lay it on top of the loom, and I take a tool and I put them through the, each slot of the reed. And then when that's done, I flip that beater back over and I sit down and I take each little thread through each heddle which is these little things. And you sit, you grab it, you put it through that little thing, and you think, I need more light. <laughs> <laughs> these glasses from the dollar store are real. And, <laughs> and then, no, I'm demonstrating. And then you have to go front, back, front, back, and you go, oh shoot, I thought about something else, so I actually made front, front, back, back. And then sometimes you're done with the warp and there are half the threads are in the wrong place, and you have to fix so I'd say at least 50% is warping, or 80%, depending. But where, so you have to purchase that? The loom? No, the, the yarn. yarn. The warp? Yeah, you, this, in this case, you couldn't do it with fabric, okay. unless you were really skilled at getting a very, very strong fabric that you could pull. Yes. But those threads, um, yeah, let's see, these are, these are recycled cotton, so you can buy uh, recycled cotton, recycled polyester. I tend to like a thicker, I really like a thicker warp. At Christina's I made a really thick warp for her. 